Good morning. Good morning to everyone. I'm Jim Gibbs, and I would like to welcome you to Gibbs Gardens Seasons of Color. I'm delighted that you decided to come today, and of course we're going to call this Good Health Day, and it's a day that we're going to all remember, and I'm sure we're going to gain a lot of knowledge from this. We're happy also that Piedmont Hospital is sponsoring this wonderful event for us, and we want to thank them. We want to also thank Barbara Snyder, who is with Gibbs Gardens, who has uh, put all this together for us. So, Barbara, we thank you. Um, I want to mention, too, that uh, you can look in the audience here. Han's mother uh, is a four-season membership of Gibbs Gardens, and if she'd stand up right quick, you can see she walks in the gardens every day. Uh, well, she doesn't walk every day, but she walks two or three uh, times a day with a friend, uh, Marty. So they're always here walking in the gardens, enjoying the gardens. So we're glad that she's with us. After our program this morning, we would like for you to take a few moments, just stroll in the gardens. We want you to really go out and sit by the streams, sit by the waterfall. We want you to reflect on nature, but it's all about the peace and tranquility, what we call the harmony of nature. So Gibbs Gardens isn't just about color, it's about nature, and it's about the balance of the natural and man-made elements. We'd also like to uh, make sure that the, uh, the demonstration that you see today uh, is performed by two people that have been working together, and I think Shannon will tell you, for six years. So they know what they're doing, and they've been living the life. Uh, Hans Rupert and Shannon Komar are going to take over the program now and we're going to let them talk about the demonstration today and we thank you all for being here and we thank all of you for participating and being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning everybody. I'm Shana Komar. I am a registered and licensed dietitian and I work with Piedmont Cancer Wellness. So I specifically see cancer patients before, during, and after treatment. And one of the wonderful things we get to do is my friend and chef here, Chef Hans and I, we get to partner together and do cooking demonstrations for our cancer patients and their caregivers. And we are bringing that to you. We are coming out of the walls of, of Piedmont Healthcare and to Gibbs Gardens today to show you a little taste of what we do in our facility. And today we're calling it Power Foods, How to Fuel Your Immune System. And we love this topic. Hans and I, we commented that we could um, probably be up here for three hours talking about food because we're both very much into healthy eating. And you're going to see throughout the recipes we are talking a lot about color, a lot about decreasing inflammation, and how to just add little bits of the nutrition knowledge that you hear on TV or you read in magazines, how you take that nutrition knowledge and move it right into your kitchen. So we want you to go home and try these recipes and then Facebook or text Hans and say this worked or this didn't work or how can I change this up? I mean, we want you to try these at home. Um, so without further ado, we're going to get started cooking here. And Hans, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Well, good, good. Well, thanks all uh, to Gibbs Gardens for having us. It's an amazing facility. Yes. And Mr. Gibbs, thanks for having us in your backyard. It's an amazing backyard. I, uh, I'm a little bit uh, green with envy, as you are all looking a little green under this tent. Um, but it is any time I remember going to elementary school and thinking, oh, it's field day, you know, we get to go and do school somewhere else. And it's just something nice about being able to step outside that environment. Um, quickly about, about the gardens, I have to be honest. When I first heard that we were going to have in our region a world-class gardens, I thought, okay, right, whatever because we've had a lot of times where people say, oh, we're going to try to build the biggest, the best, or what have you. And uh, for anybody that remembers my father, Joe, and of course my mom, too, we've always been garden people. We've always, everywhere we go, there's two important things. Is number, number one, where are we going to eat? Um, and that's at least three times a day, figuring out where we're going to eat. And number two is, do they have a botanical garden? So I've been in Jamaica, and Germany, and Austria, and Italy, and Norway. Everywhere we go, we go to botanical gardens. So when I heard world class, I thought, okay, in this area, what does that mean? And so I was hesitant to come up here for quite some time because I knew I was going to be underwhelmed. Uh, so my mom had been coming and just saying, you've got to go, you've got to go. So finally Barbara kind of twisted my arm and said, you've got to come up here. And uh, I really was completely overwhelmed. I mean, this is unlike anything I've ever seen. So uh, how fortunate, how lucky we are to be have this in our backyard. So um, if you're here today for the first time, don't let it be your last time. Get the annual pass. 
uh, because every time you come, you will see something else in bloom or something else changing. And as, as you grow, it grows. And I think it's important to, this is not a one-time event. And it definitely, I, I don't want this to be a one-time event either, but Gibbs Gardens should honestly be a part of your, uh, your sort of seasonal traditions. Make this the first or, or a part of your long-term tradition. So mm -hmm. having said that, um, I do not have a stomach, which is sometimes a little frightening. People are like, wait a second, what do you mean you don't have a stomach? I, um, over the last seven years, I've had 11 surgeries, and I often joke with my surgeon that I want one of those punch cards like you get at Subway with a 12 one is free. I also have a pretty dark sense of humor, so the irony of a chef losing his stomach was not lost on me. So oftentimes, people are more uncomfortable about it than I am. So they're like, you know, they're hesitant to ask me questions or, uh, um, and I will, I'll quickly say, you know, if, if I'm in a bad situation, I'll say, man, I just can't stomach this, you know. <laughs> I don't have a so I, uh, I, you know, big fan of sarcasm, a big fan of irony. So no question is off limits if somebody has a question about anything food-wise. But I guess what makes my situation unique, um, so I lost my, my stomach to stomach cancer or gastric cancer. And uh, as I said, I've had many surgeries, but I'm, I'm in remission. Um, but that connection between what we eat and how we feel is important in everybody. You would not open up your uh, gas tank to your new Ford or Jaguar or Maserati and pour maple syrup or Aunt Jemima or um, you know Coca-Cola in there and expect it to run at optimum efficiency. So yet we do that to ourselves every day. We you know we see the ingredients and think, well you know how bad can it be? We can't pronounce it. We don't know what it is. Um, you know our grandparents wouldn't even recognize it as food. Yet we don't think twice to put it in our body. So. I am not a, um, a food fascist. I'm not one of those people that is right. constantly saying, don't eat this, don't eat this, right. don't eat this. Instead, what Shane and I try to do is focus on what to eat. Because there's plenty, plenty of people that are gonna say, this causes cancer and this causes cancer and breathing causes cancer, okay, got it. But there are certain things that have a propensity towards um, making your body go downhill and there are certain things that have a propensity towards making your body go uphill. So we're always trying to make sure that you're, what you eat, that direct connection, I mean, it's a cliche, you are what you eat. It's a cliche because it's true. I mean, you are what you eat. So um, that's kind of what we're trying to focus on. Now, we do have one inherent challenge at Gibbs Gardens, and that is we've not built a kitchen here yet. Uh, so we are a little bit portable, uh, but we can make that work. So what we're trying to do, again, is focus on things. Everything that I cook, and I've got a cookbook, and it's in the gift shop here, is easy. Uh, and it's easy because if it's not easy, you're not going to do it. Uh, and the other part of it is I, um, the title of the book is called Eat Like There's No Tomorrow. And some people will look at that and say, man, I do that anyway. I go to the Chinese buffet and I fill that plate up 16 times and I eat like there's no tomorrow. Well, that's not really what I mean. Uh, it is not about, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Because there was a time where it looked like I wasn't gonna have it tomorrow. In fact, three times they told me to get my affairs in order that, um, that I, you know, I'm, I'm, this is the end of my journey. And uh, as my wife will tell you, I do not listen well. Um, so, uh, so here I am, my, my local doctor, Dr. McCurdy, jokes that uh, when I was at the end of my life, he wrote me a prescription for six more months. And uh, so every six months, I go and get a refill for six more months. So, <laughs> so that's the way that we do it. But um, none of us know what, what tomorrow brings or if we have it tomorrow. And as I lay after my first surgery thinking, was that my last meal, the meal that I just had? And if so, I'm not proud of that at all. We went to a, a really slightly horrible Mexican restaurant in Houston. And uh, I ate like an idiot and was miserably full to the point where I had to un unbutton my top button. And I, I sat there thinking that, man, that was a horrible way to look back and think, if I am never gonna eat again, if that was my last meal, then I really did myself a disservice. So now I try to, not in a morbid way, but in a very celebratory way, if what I'm eating today is my last meal, would I be happy with that? Could I, could I be totally content knowing that what I just ate was my final meal? And honestly, without exception, from this point forward, I am. I, uh, and it might be something as simple as a slice of brie cheese and a fresh fig and a half an apple, but that's honest, genuine food that I thoroughly enjoy and requires no effort, doesn't require any MSG or, or uh, words that are longer than the plate. Um, so that's the kind of philosophy that I try to do. Again, not preachy, um, but I can talk for a thousand years, as Shana can attest. Uh, so let me get to actually some food. So one of the first things we wanted to do is um, try to be a little seasonal. Mm -hmm. And every year I grow black-eyed peas, and you'll be amazed how many black-eyed peas you'll get from a single plant. Uh, any peas, they're so, uh, they're so abundant in how much they'll give you. And they are so fantastic if you don't cook them to death. Now, we in the South love to cook our greens until they're no longer green. 
Uh, and we love to add fat back and all these things which give flavor, but honestly, they, it makes it hard for your body to process those things. So uh, a simple kind of light uh, black eyed pea salad is what I wanted to put together. And um, it is uh, one of the things I think, and I, I always embarrass my wife, which is why she's not here, that, um, <laughs> you know, again, that direct connection between what we eat and how we feel. And some people don't like eating beans. And I, I don't think I have to explain why people shy from beans. Uh, but it is one of the most nutritionally dense protein-packed foods. And if you look back to the Great Depression, the cancer rate during the Great Depression was almost nil uh, because our great, you know, our grandparents or our great-grandparents or um, they didn't have enough money to eat meat. Or if they ate meat, it was very small quantities. What they ate was beans. And there actually is that correlation that even though the country maybe wasn't happy during that time and a lot of people had it rough, our health was actually a little better because we were eating, um, we were eating leafy greens, we were eating tons of beans. That was our main protein. Mm -hmm. uh, so incorporating beans into your diet. Now that, that sort of side effect, that famous side effect of beans actually goes away the more you eat it. So the, the reason that you get a little gassy is because if you haven't eaten beans in a while, the, the sort of microorganisms in your gut aren't used to working with that, how to break it down. But the more you incorporate it in your diet, I mean, once a day would be ideal, you'll find that that totally goes away. Um, and actually, Hans is, is correct. If you do about a half a cup every day or every other day, your body actually does start to digest it really well. And have you noticed that when you are cooking them or you let them soak, it actually opens up those enzymes and then they're not as gassy. Absolutely. And, and the most important so thing there too really well. is changing the water. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. these I've already, these were dried beans that I soaked overnight, change that water, right? Totally rinse them, get, get that soaking water out. And that honestly is 90% of the gas goes away yeah. right then. Those enzymes are broken up yep. and then it's not as gassy when you start to yep. do it on a regular basis. Absolutely. And then the, the cooking liquid as well, even though I might need cooking liquid for a soup or for whatever, I'm going to drain that liquid off yep. a second time. Uh, because again, that's where that, um, you know, almost imagine that the gas is in that water. It comes out of the bean, the bean kind of passes a little gas into the water, uh, and then it's in the water, and then you want to get it out of there so that it, you aren't getting it that way. I mean, it's, again, it's one of those embarrassing topics, but honestly, everybody sort of has to deal with that. And if, you, if you're finding it that it makes you uncomfortable to eat beans, you're not going to eat them. So I want to make sure that you understand that there is a proper way to eat them. Any of these things, honestly, some people, when they're diagnosed, switch to fresh juicing with their sure. juicing foods. Or a lot more greens, which yep. we know is good, but they can upset your yes. GI tract. Yeah. They upset right. your stomach, and then they say, well, I tried juicing, but I, it just tore up my stomach, or in my case, my gut. And so the, the problem is you went a little too gung-ho there, and right. you need to kind of, like anything you do, I mean, you don't want to pick up 100-pound pound, uh, dumbbells. The next day, your arm's going to feel like marshmallows. You have to ramp yourself up to anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, in life. So um, the same with beans. So these have been, as I said, they've been uh, cooked and, uh, and sort of uh, just to the point where they're barely, I'm going to do this whole thing. I've got a bunch. We're going to do some, uh, some tastings with some of the folks here. It is impossible to do tastings for everybody for something that's large unless we turn it into a catering event and then it's more catering than class. So it really is about technique. And I, I think we have copies of the recipes today. Yep, everybody has a so copy. Yes. Now the important thing is that you're looking here, not there because I have to give a little two-second spiel on recipes. <laughs> I hate recipes. I think recipes are, are they're, they're like blinders for a horse because you're, you're, you, you don't see or you don't feel what's going on. Now, right now it's Vidalia onion season, just sort of at the end of it. So whatever the recipe calls for, you could probably quadruple it and still be fine. If it was the middle of winter, it, you, know, you might want to cut that in half. So you have to taste everything. You have to know or, or even the smell of it, you know, whatever works for you. Or if you have a particular allergy or something you don't like, feel free to, to these are just suggestions. This is just kind of like if I, you know, we own the Woodbridge in, in Jasper and somebody asked me how to go to Gibbs Gardens, well, there's like four ways to get here and all of them get you here. So I don't care if you go Cove Road or if you come 53, whatever way you want to go, you're going to get here about the same amount of time and the end result is going to be the same. So that's, in my mind, cooking is a lot like driving. Don't worry about how do I get there. Worry about where you're going. There's a lot of ways to get there, and you can you can cheat on some of these things too. I mean, um, there there are ways to take. If you don't have fennel, for example, we'll talk about fennel in a second. You can use celery. If you don't have celery, you can omit it all together. If you don't have black eyed peas, you can use pinto beans. So glance at the recipe, get the idea of kind of what does this encompass, and then make it your own. I, I'm not uh, I'm not proprietary. I don't care that you make this different. Uh, make it your version of what Hans showed me. This is a great idea, and then you go from there. So. And one of the really good things to take out of this cooking demo is to cook locally and in season. 
Um, we know that that is the highest amount of nutrients that you can get, especially if you can't always buy organic. But if you buy local and in season, and Hans and I, when we do our cooking demos weekly, we always call each other and say, okay, what's in season? What can we pick and bring right to our clinic or right to the um, cooking demo? That's very, very good for your body and also locally for the no, environment. For the local and for economy the as well, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and the notice uh, Shane is wearing a kale shirt. Uh, we do a lot of kale classes, yes. and guess what we couldn't find in the market this morning was kale. Yeah. Uh, Both you know, of us were texting back and forth, I can't find it, I can't find it. It's at the end of the season. It's at the end of the season. Yeah. You know, so, um, we wanted to use it. We love kale, but we, yeah. get, we, we buy in season. In so. fact, we do a, we do a class uh, called Kale is not a four-letter word. And uh, the first time I did the class, my mom said, yes, it is. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> think, think about the bigger, the bigger picture there. Uh, I'm sure she was thinking, yeah, how am I spelling it? Anyway, uh, so, but, okay, so back to the point, essentially, though, is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I love what she said about eating, eating local and of the season. Now, um, and I can get preach about this, and a lot of this stuff is in the cookbook, so sometimes you have to kind of take a shepherd's hook and drag me off. Having said, I'd rather you eat local. I would rather you buy a Chilean strawberry, if that's the only thing available, and eat fresh fruit, than not eat it at all. Not, so, what we're saying is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with anything, if you have the preference, organic and local, if you don't have the preference, still eat the, the, yeah. the fresh. Yeah. Um, and I, I always say, if I eat, you ever eaten like a big piece of steak and a baked potato, and afterwards you just feel like, ugh, <laughs> like it, did, it did literally drains everything out of you. And it, because it, it really is draining everything out of you. Your body has to actually create those digestive enzymes to break that stuff down and move it through. And all your blood's going right yep. to your belly to work through and so that. Yeah. With me, that is amplified a hundredfold. So your stomach is basically sort of a waiting room. It is, uh, it's sort of a purgatory where your body's kind of slowly working these things and getting them ready to go down to digestion. I don't have that. So when I eat, it goes straight into my gut. So for me, if I eat something heavy and, and overcooked, and I feel heavy and overcooked, if I eat something fresh and vibrant and like whatever, I feel fresh and vibrant. And people always ask me, you're like a hummingbird. I'm like, you know, a thousand miles a minute. What is it? Am I drinking sugar water? No. Um, it is honestly the foods that I eat. I, I eat fresh and healthy foods constantly. I need to eat about six meals a day, uh, small meals. I'm supposed to be snacking right now. So uh, uh, I have to eat a little differently, but it's, it, my energy level is always up and my enthusiasm is always up. Um, and I think it's because of the foods that I eat. So, okay, so we got the black-eyed peas yeah. that took 20 minutes to talk about one ingredient. <laughs> uh, all right, so next is fennel. So fennel, I have the bulb portion of fennel, I have the actual plant there. So fennel, this is what it looks like. It's a little sad right now because it's been out in the heat. Um, and there are two different main types of fennel. There's the Italian bulb fennel, which is this, and there's also just the herbaceous fennel, which sometimes you'll have growing in the garden in containers. Uh, monarch butterflies, butterflies in general, they love them. Uh, and they particularly like the bronze fennel, which is a darker color. I grow in the garden at the Woodbridge the herbaceous kind, which never sets a bulb. It's just this nice leafy green. You can use it uh, finely chopped as a garnish on, uh, or as a seasoning on seafood, or mixed into a chicken salad, or things like that. So I use this in two separate ways. I do use the, the fronds, those little kind of leafy, ferny bits, uh, as, a, as a spice or as an herb. And then I use the bulb, just like I would celery. And if you ask somebody to describe what does uh, fennel taste like, it tastes a little like licorice. But then people remember that kind of tarry, black, gummy stuff, and they go, ooh, I don't want that. So it's, it's not that. So if, even if you have an aversion to the black, sticky licorice, I think you'll find that you like, I've had a lot of people that have, I think that's sort of a hobby of mine, is turning people's opinions on food around. They say, I hate okra, I can make them eat okra every time. Or I hate Brussels sprouts, and I did too for a long time because they were being overcooked, and now it's one of my favorite veggies. So I always kind of make it a personal challenge to have people come over there, uh, their inhibitions with food. But so anytime a recipe calls for celery, you can interchange it with fennel or do half and half or vice versa. Uh, but it is a really nice fibrous, uh, crunchy uh, vegetable and it works great in a salad like this. And this is essentially just the diced uh, bulb portion that is gonna go right in there. Now I'm gonna use some of the greens in here towards the end, but that's the, uh, that's the crunch. Now, uh, you can also do uh, onions in here, and I actually have, and the one that's going to be tasting, I have some grilled Vidalia onions, and I grilled them just to kind of bring out some of the sugars. Vidalia onions actually have, depending on the, the time of year, more sugar than an apple. Uh, and by sugar, I mean natural sugar, not, not cane sugar. And uh, so they're inherently sweet, and sometimes getting a little char on them, getting a little grill on there, kind of helps bring those sweetness out. So I have a little bit of uh, grilled Vidalia onion in the salad that's in the back, um, because 
head. And it's one of those things that uh, sometimes the recipe kind of evolves or changes as I go along because I have them on hand. So, uh, tomatoes, and these are diced and somewhat seeded. I, um, I'll put the whole thing in. I don't know why I do that. Like when I'm doing this, I know I'm going to use it all and I like put it in by portion. <laughs> so there is, uh, there's some tomatoes in there. And we're just at the beginning of the tomato season. And you'll find if you, if you visit the farmer's markets, you've got a great one just here off of uh, Steve Tate Highway. And there's also one in Jasper, which is fantastic. At the beginning of the season, everybody's on the hunt for tomatoes. And like, do you have tomatoes? Do you have tomatoes? And by 8 a.m., all the tomatoes are gone. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, everybody's like, their tables are overflowing with tomatoes. Like, please take my tomatoes. <laughs> uh, and I have farmers come by the Woodbridge, and they'll say, how about 20 bucks for the whole thing? And I open my cooler and go, how about you buy mine? You know, I've got, <laughs> I've got tons of them. So it's just funny that people get excited about the seasons. And then after tomato season goes Oprah season. 7 o'clock, mm -hmm. all the Oprah's mm -hmm. gone. Two weeks later, everybody's just overflowing with Oprah. And one of the good things to do with those tomatoes, particularly if you're a man out there, because we know of the lycopene in it, is to um, make it into sauce and freeze it. Because then it's Absolutely. wonderful and you can eat it over time. You don't have to eat all those tomatoes right right at the mar market Yeah, then. Or you can oven dry yeah, them, yeah. work them into compound butters. Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of compound butters, which are essentially with herbs, even if I have an abundance of anything, fennel, basil, whatever, you can make basically puree it, uh, make almost like a pesto, and mm -hmm. then work it into a pound of butter, freeze that, and you've got it all year round. You've got that locked into butter. You make a steak or a piece of fish, you cut off a thin sliver of that butter, let it melt over the top, and you've got dinner. So it's a crazy easy way to, to maintain those flavors. Yep, and cooking the tomatoes open up that nutrient lycopene even more. So that's particular good, for the yeah. men out there. That's a good point. Cooking tomatoes. I talk about oftentimes eating raw. And that doesn't mean raw beef. <laughs> it doesn't mean raw fish or right. raw possum. It means mainly <laughs> raw, uh, raw fruits and veggies. Right, right. Now, once you go above about 140 degrees, and it's different on the different foods, but you start to kill off the enzymes that are inherent in those foods. So the nice thing about if I pick up and eat this fennel, I'm going to be chewing for a long time, so I'm not going to do it. But that has in it the enzymes my body needs to break it down. So it's, it's kind of cool how foods work like that. They already have in them what you need to process them. So it's almost like you buy a uh, batteries included. You buy the Christmas morning, you get the toy, and you go, man, I gotta have batteries for that. Well, with this, the batteries included. It has the enzymes in that you need to break them down. Same with kale, same with cabbage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in the South, we take that kale and we cook it. And then three hours later, we're still cooking it. And six hours later, it smells like something died and we're still cooking it, and we're still cooking it. And it's, it's not, it's not alive anymore. We've, we've cooked it to death. I mean, literally, we've cooked it to death. So when I cook it, sometimes I'm literally just threatening it. I'm just hitting mm -hmm. a high skillet. I dump it in there. In fact, we're going to do a little dish here in a second with romaine. I'm going to hit it on a high heat and then turn the heat off. Just get it to wilt a little bit, and then I'm done. So in and the that's what's good it, to do with the tomatoes. Absolutely. Yeah. Same with the tomatoes. So by yeah. hitting that heat, it opens it up. Mm -hmm. It brings out those things. Sometimes they're kind of locked in there. They need right. to be scared out of their out of their environment. And then once they're out, then your body can process it. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to keep cooking it. Um, so <laughs> back to what we're doing. I'm sorry. I'm easily distracted. They didn't have ADD when I was a kid, but I'm starting to think I had it. Um, so think about salt. Salt is an extractant. Now this is a salt blend that I make, and it's in the gift shop here. It's called Out of the Blue, and it has lavender flowers in it. It has coriander. It has white pepper. But I mean, you can, you can do this with just salt. But salt is an extractant. And so as I put in some salt, the neat thing about this is that this will taste better this afternoon than it does now. It'll taste better tomorrow than it does today. Because the salt in there and these spices together are all going to have a little party and get to know each other. And they're going to start pulling out some of uh, If you put a piece of um, wax paper down and put a piece of meat even or whatever out there, put a little salt on it, and 10 minutes later you come back, you're going to see little bubbles of liquid on the top because the salt is pulling the liquid out. So by mixing salt in here at an early stage, I'm not trying to make this salty by any means. Now, it looks like I put a lot of salt, but this is a lot of salad. Um, by putting salt in early, it's going to help get those things out. So I don't want to salt it last. I want to salt it early. And you can always add more salt. You can't take it out. Um, so I've made things before. I over-salt them. And what do I do? Well, then you add more beans, and you add more fennel, and you add more tomato, and then you got more salad. And before you know it, you're feeding 100 people. <laughs> so start low on the salt. You can always add more. Um, but I'm trying to have just enough salt to where it brings out the natural flavors. If you've ever eaten an underripe piece of fruit, underripe watermelon, you put the salt on, just a little bit of salt on there, it tastes more like what it should taste. Because it really does, it is a flavor enhancer. But if you go beyond a certain point, it now becomes unhealthy. It slows your blood down. It gets it's, um, all the issues with sodium. So a little salt goes a long way.
Yeah, and along those lines, um, Hans, do you use a lot of lemon to also Absolutely. replace yeah. some of the salt? So some of your citrus works really well if you do have high blood pressure. Instead of using a lot of salt, you can actually squeeze extra lemon on it and get that salt flavor. And also, we use a lot of bigger pieces of salt when we do our cooking demos, not the ionized sodium. That's, yeah, that's a good point, too. Uh, back in your, when you say iodized salt, what does that mean? Well, they've actually added... Um, iodine to the right. salt because we used to be way back in the day we didn't have enough iodine in our uh, in our foodstuffs but now with all the processed foods that we eat there's no way anybody's gonna have an iodine deficiency right. anymore it's just it's not possible so by using sea salt mm -hmm. if you taste them side by side iodized salt tastes a little a little medicinal it has I mean it's salty of course but it has just a little something extra a little astringency to it and if you eat sea salt uh, or even kosher salt, which is basically just mine. You know, it used to be sea salt. The sea receded, and what was left there is sea salt, but locked in a cave. Um, you eat sea salt, and it has that taste of the sea. It's a it's a freshness to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's salty, but it has a it has something different to it. It's a different. And you'll notice that when you're making things like this. Iodized salt is not your friend in cooking. You know, use it to gargle when you got an ulcer in your mouth. Uh, great for that. But otherwise, I wouldn't use it in the kitchen at all. I, I don't use iodized salt at all in the kitchen. I don't even have it on my tables with the wood bridge. We use, uh, it's a finely granulated uh, sea salt. I don't want people adding iodine. You wouldn't grab the bottle of iodine and shake it on your food, and so I don't want you to do the same thing at home. Uh, I didn't bring a spoon, so I'm gonna use the back of a fork. I'm gonna MacGyver this a little bit. Uh, when I was on the Food Network, uh, back in 2005, I was on a show called The Next Food Network Star, and they were asking us to kind of overcome challenges, and when the cameras are rolling, you're not allowed to stop. Like, whatever happens, if my pants fall down, I'm gonna keep talking. I might slowly and subtly pull them back up, but I'm gonna keep talking. So we, you know, we got the training, I'm supposed to, and I'm not looking at the camera, I'm looking at the person on the other side of the camera, and, and I learned that from Paula Dean. She's a wonderful woman. I've got embarrassing stories I can tell about her that involve other four-letter words that we won't do it now. Uh, so, uh, but what, one of the things is, whatever happens, you keep going. Well. This was, I was in two weeks in Manhattan, you know, Georgia boy in Manhattan. I was nervous anyway, but a lot of the challenges they gave us, we didn't realize were rigged. Now, of course, we watch these cooking shows now, and you know that they're setting them up to fail, but this was season one. There was no Top Chef. There was no, I was on the first ever cooking competition. And uh, one of the challenges they set out there was for me to ice a cake. Well, I, I've never iced a cake in my life. Uh, other people do that, right? My grandmother does that. I, I cook. I'm not a baker. So I get out there and the cameras are rolling and they're, I'm, I'm reading the teleprompter and I'm doing pretty good with that because I've done some TV stuff in the past and I reach in to get the spreader and it's carrot peeler. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, so I just started trying to spread the thing with the carrot peeler. And uh, then I was supposed to pipe rosettes around it and I pick it up and it literally is just like, Black. It's just running out as soon as I pick it up, and so I'm like, or you can call it a chocolate explosion cake. So I have learned that you just keep going no matter what you have or what you don't have. So what I'm putting in here now is uh, coriander, and this is a ground coriander, and coriander is the seed of the same plant that is cilantro. So oftentimes you'll see, especially like in, in the rest of the world, calls that coriander seed, uh, that they call coriander leaf, not cilantro. Uh, so it is the same thing. It's just a different, uh, different flavor, a different complexity. It works great with beans. Uh, and then the other one that works great with beans is cumin. Now cumin is the same thing though that kind of gives, when you buy like a taco seasoning, which I, I'm not a big fan of like those kind of um, taco seasonings. You don't know what's in them. Uh, but this has that kind of an earthy smell. And I, I don't mean that in a negative way. It is, um, you know, when you think of curries, the main color in curry is turmeric, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah, sure. Their main flavor in curry is, is cumin. And it has, again, that kind of earthiness, and it works so well with beans. Um, but a little goes a long way. It can almost taste a little muddy if you, if you get too much of it. So same sort of thing. Always start light and then add to it. I have suggested uh, amounts in the cookbook or in the recipe. It's only suggested because, again, depending on the intensity of the, uh, of the tomatoes or, the, or even the the water content of the tomatoes. If it's a really watery tomato, you might need more spice because the spice is going to bind to that water and go down. And then every time you go back to the fridge to eat this, you want to make sure you give it a good stir or put it in the container and shake it uh, because a lot of those spices are going to try to settle and it's going to create this really nice sort of you know, pot liquor on the bottom that you want to shake up and make sure that it stays uh, throughout the whole thing. What am I forgetting? Oh yeah, oil and vinegar. So again, this is meant to be a cold uh, salad kind of or at least a room temperature. And I want some kind of like salad dressing kind of things to it. I'm using a white balsamic vinegar, and um, it's just like the balsamic vinegar, but just like the difference between white, uh, excuse me, white wine and red wine. Uh, they, when they are kind of marinating and macerating the grapes, they do it without the skins. 
So if you want that kind of nice sweet flavor of balsamic, but you don't want the muddy color of balsamic, go for white balsamic vinegar. And uh, it's always in my, in my pantry. Uh, and then a good olive oil. Um, we aren't growing olives here yet, I imagine. Huh? <laughs> Haven't figured that one out. We need to figure out a North Georgia olive. We've got copper fennel up at the road store. Well, good, good, good. Oh, and it, do you notice um, when the, monarch, the, the butterfly caterpillars, so we always plant extra. Uh, we've never, ever, ever at the Woodbury Gin in almost 40 years used an herbicide or pesticide. And we don't plan to. And so I plant a little extra. So if I need, if I need for the restaurant 12 of these, mm -hmm. I plant 16 for the caterpillars. They're going to have theirs. And they're the gorgeous, big, fat caterpillars with the stripes green and yellow and black stripes. And they love it. And so we just let them do their thing. And then we eat the rest. So, um, yeah, it, it's a, such a great complement plant, even in your, um, in your ornamentals, you know, not the edibles. I always like to try to grow edibles anywhere you got soil. The thing about herbs is they thrive on neglect. And we do a whole classes on mm -hmm. herbs, and I think we should do a class here on herbs. Mm -hmm. um, number one, they're so easy to do, but they thrive on neglect. If you try to, people say, man, I bought fertilizer, and I'm, uh, they're in the best location, I got them in the best pot, and they just aren't thriving, because you're, you're over pampering them. I wouldn't thrive either if you're constantly doting on me. <laughs> let, me let me make some mistakes, you know, mom, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> And also, it's probably one of the only ingredients that you can get that's no calories, no fat, huge yeah. with vitamin and mineral yeah. content. Ridiculous amounts of flavor. Right. Yeah. All yeah. antioxidants in it. So when you want to ramp up your food, and we often talk about how do you make ordinary food extraordinary? You know, what's that pop? It's what extra, changes yeah. it? It's usually the fresh herbs. It's fresh herbs. Yeah. And, and same, same honestly, when it's sort of a restaurant trick. I mean, yeah. people, if you're going to a good restaurant, but it's, you know, people are like, why does mine not taste like, I've got, the chef wrote down everything for me, what's the difference? Right. The difference is, I go out my kitchen door and I've got a really impressive herb garden back there, mm -hmm. and we utilize those fresh herbs, and uh, at the last minute, if you, if you eat them, if you eat them too early, they kind of get, you know, they, they aren't as uh, fresh, I use them at the last minute. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing on herbs too, the more you cut them, the more you get. And you'll notice on some things like coleus or some of the uh, ornamental things that if it's growing and you cut that middle stalk, it now has two more stalks. I almost flicked you guys off, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it was all in educational life, I swear. So um, you cut this middle one off though, and now these two are gonna come. And then you cut the main off of those, and then so it, it literally doubles every time you cut it. So with mint, you, well, once you have mint, by the way, you always have mint. Yeah. You'll never yeah. get rid of mint. So go at mint with both feet, because you're not kinda doing mint, you're doing mint. <laughs> um, so but once you do it, people think, well, I don't wanna cut it, I don't wanna use it, I need it for, you know, not realizing that the more the more aggressive you are with it, the more it's going to reward you. Uh, so then, lastly, on the herbs that I'm going to use, this is the the fronds of the of the fiddle, and there's a little bit of these kind of uh, stalky pieces from the upper part there. But again, I mean, as long as you're cutting them into uh, into bite-sized pieces, um, that's kind of the last thing I'm going to add in there. And again, as this sits, it just becomes a fantastic summer salad. You can put it in a wrap. Uh, or you can put it in a, in a piece of pita bread, you know, like a, almost like a tabbouleh. Or put it over lettuce the next day. Absolutely, a little or a little lettuce salad. cup wrap yep. things are great. So um, it is crazy packed full of protein. Yeah, um, and our big powerhouse, as Hans mentioned, definitely the, um, the peas, but the fennel. Yeah. The fennel has enzymes in it that actually attack unhealthy cells in your body. So not even just cancer, but heart disease, any type of di um, diabetes, arthritis, any of those inflammatory diseases. When you eat flannel, fennel, it can directly attack those off genes and off cells. It's just hard to say inflammatory and fennel. And fennel in the same, same sentence. You're right. You're right. So that's a powerhouse salad right there. Vegetarian, vegan, in fact. Yeah, absolutely. And it absolutely. lasts for a while. You yeah, make it honestly, once. It doesn't you know, last you seven days yeah. if, if you're lazy. I mean, because I go back to it you know, four or five times a day. Uh, my wife, too, if I make something like this, we'll all kind of go back to it. We might be having a, a sandwich or whatever, but that's going to be the side or it's going to be the, the center of the plate. So it's a salad that has center of the plate uh, presence. And again, there's absolutely what in there is bad. Uh, and the thing is, and I, I'll, I'll clean up the version of what my dad said. Right at the beginning of my cookbook, my dad always said, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken poop. Uh, but he didn't say poop. Uh, and so what does that mean is you can't. I, if I, I can't, if everything here tastes right. good on its own, mm -hmm. how do I mess that up? I mean, the only way I can mess it up, maybe if I put too much salt or whatever. But I mean, as long as you're doing everything in moderation, there's nothing bad in here, unless you just personally don't like one thing, in which case omit it. Um, so I think that really is a, an important lesson. Now, you're not gonna have in your, in your um, spice cabinet or whatever, you're not gonna have uh, Trisodium phosphate, or uh, or all these weird long words. Partially hydrogenated oils and all that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I would not, um, and I can talk about those things forever too. 
But again, I, I don't want to. I don't want to really focus on the negative. Right. But they're scary, and I'll, oftentimes some of those things. Um, I when I go shopping for the restaurant, I can buy Coca Cola, or I can buy Mexican Coca Cola. The difference being high fructose corn syrup is illegal to use in Mexico mm -hmm. and most of the rest of the world. Yet we think nothing of it. And again, I won't get preachy. I promise I won't. Uh, but I mean, to me, it's interesting that in Mexico they got you know they're figuring out that that stuff's pretty evil. So um, you wouldn't, I wouldn't feed it wherever my daughter is. I wouldn't feed her. There she is. Uh, high fructose corn syrup, um, just like I wouldn't pour it in my car, and I drive a Ford. So um, it is important to treat your body as well as you do your Ford. So that is our salad. I'm going to pour it mm -hmm. into a, a kind of a glass bowl here so you can see it. Um, and uh, Shane, any other things in there that uh, we yeah, need to no, talk about? Yeah, no, I definitely want to talk about the powerhouse being the fennel and the, and the um, peas. And let's move on to the peach quesadilla. All We're right. ready for that. Good, good, good. So it is, uh, we are in the peach state. Um, I learned a lot about peaches. I did a, I did a show for Jordan Public Broadcasting uh, called Hans Cooks the South, which almost, that name almost sounds like an oxymoron, you know. Yeah. <laughs> South Bavaria or what? You know, so um, uh, I am a half kraut. I mean, it is, that is true. My dad is from Germany. My mom is from Georgia. So I, I am half sauerkraut, half uh, half grits, I guess. Um, I think that's an Osmond song or something. Isn't it? Uh, so uh, I, I'm always trying to incorporate Georgia wherever I can. Mm -hmm. And so I did a show called Hans Cooks of South Georgia. And the, the goal there, my friend Hewitt here, uh, on camera was my partner in crime, and we had a really a crazy adventure. I wish we had taped our adventures because two guys in a in a uh, in an SUV with cameras, and we we're going farm to table all over the entire state. We've been on shrimp boats, uh, you know, up to our knees in jellyfish, and we've been uh, uh, or or green seasick on that shrimp boat, or we've been uh, in blueberry fields being attacked by mosquitoes, or uh, we've been in uh, grass-fed beef pastures. And we we really had an adventure of a lifetime, and we want to do it again, but. Uh, I learned a lot. I was very gung-ho organic coming into that experience. Uh, and I still, of course, believe that's the way to go. But when you start talking with some of the farmers and you realize that the certification organic is a government regulation that costs about, depending on the size of your operation, anywhere from eight grand to 80 grand to get a piece of paper that says you're organic. So even if they're doing it 100% right, they can't say they're doing it right unless they get that government stamp. So when you go to these farmers markets, the question isn't, are you certified organic? The question is, Hey, what's your name? I'm so and so. Where's your farm? Do you use pesticides? You establish that one on one relationship with the people that are growing it. And you ask them the question. Of course, they can lie to you, but you hope that, they're, that they don't. Or if you want to go see the farm, go see their farm. But the thing I learned about peaches there are no organic peach farms right. in Georgia, in South Carolina, and nowhere. Because uh, just as much as we love peaches, critters love peaches too. Mm -hmm. uh, fungus love peaches. I mean, it's a, peaches are damn good. So the whole world <laughs> wants to eat peaches. So what they have to do though they have to treat the peach trees at a very early age when they are still just buds essentially you know, that's as they're as they're starting to fruit that's when they have to uh, to treat them so if they're treating them at that early stage by the time they fruit there's no traces at all of of pesticides or or insecticides they're totally safe to eat but they can't call them certified organic so it's important that you kind of know what that word means and of course some people have said well if it has carbon in it Science teaches me that everything with carbon in it is organic based, you know, so that's not what it means. I mean, it, so really it's more about the how it's grown. Mm -hmm. uh, so peaches are one that you do want to wash to make sure that they're, if somebody did spray them, you get that excess off. And of course, if they're fuzzy, if you want to peel them, peel them. Uh, that's where most of those, if they were uh, sprayed or treated, that's where most of that lives is in that outer. Uh, but at the same time, that's where most of the nutrition is. Yeah, you so get a lot of nutrients It's, it's kind of a call. And right. again, base that on. Right. Where do they come from? How are they raised? Mm -hmm. um, and wash them really well. Exactly. Yeah. So be mindful of that. So I want to I wanted to make a salsa for a quesadilla um, that had some elements of peach in there. And so I've got the salsa already made. And I'm just going to show you this because um, the folks who taste it, and I'll have some in the back there. It again involves the fennel because I'm trying want to try to tie all this together a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our unifying force here. You could use celery, but I've got some grilled vidalia onions. I've got some chopped peaches, which I put on the grill. Just for a second, just to get a little char in there, not blackened, but if you cut the peach in half, get the stone out, sometimes if the stone is stuck, putting it on the grill for a second kind of helps loosen the stone, uh, but it brings out some, uh, kind of caramelizes it, uh, not only in color, but in flavor. Uh, fresh tomatoes, and just a pinch of salt, and then the fronds of the fennel. So this is a really fresh, this is basically raw. Even though I had it on the grill for just a second, it's basically a raw salsa. Uh, you can make that spicy as well if you want to. I, I can't do spicy anymore. 
Uh, but spicy food is great as a metabolism booster. If you're trying to work a little spice into it, it's not a bad thing at all. Um, so spice it as you like it, and you can control that. But for me, the salsa is a way to temper some of the heat of what's in the quesadilla if you want to do peppers inside of here. So the quesadilla portion, I'm going to do uh, just a simple whole wheat uh, tortilla. Almost every tortilla you find is going to have uh, hydrogenated oils in there. So really read those packages. There are good ones out there, plenty of good ones out there. Yeah, there's actually one in your regular grocery store called Tamoxicos, and that is in the um, refrigerated area, and there are no hydrogenated oils in it. And it's a whole grain one. You definitely want to do whole grain. Look on the ingredients for 100% whole grain, but Tamoxicos is a good brand. All right, so I almost missed my steps here. So I grilled some chicken, and the chicken was spiced with a little bit of cinnamon. It's another one of those mm. great, uh, great spices, and we'll talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, a little salt and pepper, and actually I put a little turmeric in there just for, for some color. So it's just a simple grilled chicken. I like chicken breasts, uh, sorry, chicken thighs better. Uh, I know some people have some, some issues with dark meat, so I did chicken breast today, but use whichever you like. Basically, it's just chicken, uh, or whatever you like. You can, this can be vegetarian. You could actually take some of the leftover beans and, and do a vegetarian version. But the quesadilla has cheese in it, and I'm using a brie cheese, and the, as hot as it is out here, this brie got a little, uh, a little ripe, but that's actually the way to, that's great. But I'm going to use the, uh, the, the brie as sort of a glue to hold this thing together. So you can do this two ways. You can take two tortillas and make, you know, one, fill it up, and then put the other on there, but then it's impossible to flip. So I'd rather do, stay on one half of the, uh, of the tortilla and, uh, and fold it over is a much better way to do it. So we're going to go in then with some strips of the grilled chicken. Uh, and again, anything works here. Don't be limited by what I'm showing you. If you want to do beef, do it fine in moderation. Um, you know, beans. Yeah, beans are perfect. They always kind of tell you, really, meat should not be, the way we eat is we eat a meat and two, 80-20 or 80-10-10. It really should be the other way around. Right. It should be meat is the, the 10, it may be the 20. And uh, you know, they recommend eating a piece of meat about the size of a deck of cards, and that's about what I have in there. Mm -hmm. um, that's all the, pro all the meat you need in there. Try to get more plant proteins in. Yeah, Things three quarters of your plate should be your color. If you think about eating from a rainbow, um, three quarters of the plate, and then that last quarter should be, like Hans just said, that protein. That's a very good rule of thumb when you're looking at your plate. So again, I've got some fennel of the fronds here. And uh, so this is going to be some nice color. And of course, you can put spinach in this. You can put tomatoes. I mean, the, the great thing about a quesadilla, they are incredibly customizable. You can put, it's like when you go to that, if you've been to Moe's uh, kind mm -hmm. of burrito place, and it's just like Subway. You walk down, I want that, 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 and that. Do that at home. And you can customize each one for each person as you're making this. So uh, it is what you want it to be. If you have extra peaches, you can put some peaches in there as well. But again, we've got the peach um, in the salsa. So I want to put just a little more of this nice and sticky brie on top here, and I'm just gonna use my fingers, I apologize. But uh, I wanna use this again as the glue. This is gonna be what kind of binds this whole thing together. And uh, then we'll flip this, close it up. And I have pretty heat resistant fingers from years of doing this. Um, and ideally if you have a weight, weight this down a little bit. I'll take another skillet here and put this on top. Now I'd rather go low and slow than high heat. So I wanna, I wanna let this go low heat for a long time so that the cheese melts, everything kind of gets to know each other slowly. If you go hot, you're going to burn the outside of that. I want there to, it'll form almost like a little crispy edge to it. I'll turn this up just a tad, and we'll let that melt. So the, uh, you can use the spinach wraps, they have the sun-dried tomato wraps, so don't be afraid to make that whatever, you know, whatever you want it to be. Why don't you talk about for yeah. a second what our things are in there? Sure. Um, first of all, this salsa, you're going to love it. Oh, it's one of our favorite dishes that Hans makes. And really, with your tomatoes and your peaches and your fennel, what the word that comes to mind is antioxidants. I mean, that is a, a whole food, healthy salsa for you to make a big amount of it and then eat off of it multiple times. And if you're unfamiliar, antioxidants is a big buzzword right now. If you're unfamiliar with what it means, is it basically is all of your plant chemicals that are protecting your cells. So it's almost like um, a football player wears football pads to protect himself from invasion, from the environment, from smoking, from um, different diseases, and that's what, when you eat all these fruits and vegetables, that's what you're getting. You're getting all these colorful antioxidants. And a lot of your studies show you gotta get all different colors. That's why we're showing the, the peaches and the tomatoes, the reds and the oranges and the fennel being green. You have to get lots of different colors to get all those different antioxidants. 
And the really cool thing about Hans's chicken, which I like, is that he uses cinnamon. And I don't know if you're familiar, but cinnamon is a very good spice to fight diabetes. So if we have any diabetes or diabetics in the audience, it actually helps control your blood sugars. So cinnamon is a very good addition to a regular um, daily eating routine if you're a diabetic. Cinnamon is also a thickener. I think people don't realize it either when you're cooking or baking making cinnamon apples. Cinnamon has a, a lot of natural, like, like gluten does, mm -hmm. although it's not gluten, but it has a binding element that actually helps thicken things. When we're making bananas foster at the Woodbridge, the cinnamon goes into that sauce early to help make the sauce. It helps bind. I don't know if you've seen on the internet, do not try this at home, but there's a cinnamon challenge on the internet. Right. And uh, where they try somebody, you know, can you eat a spoon, a teaspoon full of cinnamon? It is basically impossible to do. Because as soon as you try to swallow, it basically turns into a big ball and won't go down. And so there's all these videos of people trying to gag and cinnamon shoots out of their mouth. And it's funny, but it can be really dangerous too because it can go in your lungs uh -huh. and cause issues. Uh, but so in, put it on the chicken. In other put words, it on the put chicken. it on the chicken. Yeah, and, and then again, you know, like anything else, it's in moderation. Right. Uh, but you can go a pretty good bit of cinnamon. And there are different degrees of quality of cinnamon too. If you've had cinnamon in your... Uh, in your cabinet or whatever for two or more years, get rid of it and go buy some, some decent cinnamon. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll find with any of the spices that they, they have in them these sort of volatile essential oils. When they hit heat, as we were talking about earlier with the food, that's when they release those, those flavor compounds. They really come alive when they hit heat. Uh, or, or sometimes vinegar too or uh, things like that will kind of help bring them out. But they become like sawdust. If they've lost their color, if your dried dill doesn't even remind you of green anymore, it's not good anymore. Uh, or if it has no smell to it at all, you, you might as well add sawdust to your dish because you're doing exactly the same thing. You're taking a plant you know, fiber that has no residual qualities to it. So I'd rather you buy smaller quantities uh, more often than don't buy the big industrial, unless you have a restaurant, don't buy the big industrial ones. You might be saving money up front, but you're going to end up having to you know, redo them and throw them away. The other spice that Hans used, now where did you use the turmeric? You used it in the pea salad, correct? Uh, no, I actually used it, I'm going to use it with the remain, but I used it in the okay. chicken. So Great. it's well, with the chicken and the cinnamon in there. Perfect. Our turmeric is an Indian spice, if you're all familiar with it. It makes everything yellow, so be very careful. Fingers, clothes, yeah. it will everything. Stand, yeah. um, but it's an anti-carcinogenic, anti-microbial, anti-inflammatory, huge, huge, huge for health. Um, so this is one of those good spices, like Hans said, not to buy a massive container, but buy a small one and sprinkle it into lots of your foods. And a very good combination to get the most power out of your turmeric is olive oil and black pepper mixed with the turmeric. Yeah, so you're using your dishes and using some olive oil and black pepper with them. It's in the same family as ginger, and yep. you can find it fresh sometimes. This is a fresh ginger hand, they call them. Um, you can find them, and they're usually about, gosh, a tenth of this. They're real small, uh, and you can plant them. They'll make little almost miniature ginger-looking plants. They're, they're really pretty plants. Um, and when it's fresh, you can just grate it using mm -hmm. a microplane, which is these, um, these handy little kitchen guys here, and I'll, I'll do some ginger in a minute. Um, but you just grate it, and then at that moment, that's when it really opens mm -hmm. it up. You can find turmeric fresh, but as uh, Shana mentioned, right. it will stain right. everything. Yeah. If I come home from a cooking demo, <laughs> I am yellow. I mean, totally yeah. yellow from that stuff. Not a bad thing. But I, um, when I was first diagnosed, I, my particular cancer was gastric cancer, but I had an adenocarcinoma. The uh, first thing they prescribed for me was turmeric in the form of pills. And it was essentially just a capsule full of that uh, because it is known to help. Before they did my surgery, they wanted that tumor as, as shrunken as possible. To reduce the known. inflammation. It absolutely shrinks tumors. So, yeah. you know, you might not even know that you have a tumor, uh, and I hope that you don't. But if you do, eating turmeric can actually help contain those things and keep it from spreading. And you might see it called curcumin because that's the active ingredient in it. So just so that you're aware, if it's the supplement or even the spice, a lot of times you'll see curcumin mentioned along with turmeric. Yeah, it definitely is uh, one of the things you need to have. Now, it is bitter um, <laughs> if you go overboard. So just right. like ginger, ginger can get hot. I mean, so a lot of these things, I mean, that's a, it's true in life all the way around. Anything in excess is bad, right? I mean, you can mm -hmm. go beyond a point. Mm -hmm. So um, no matter how well you think it is, more doesn't mean better. So you want to use, I love it, it's one of my favorite spices, but you want to use it in moderation. Right. Uh, because it can absolutely turn a delicious dish into a really bitter dish. So use it, uh, use it sparingly. Uh, so with the quesadilla then, uh, it actually is best if you can kind of let it sit for a little while, just a few minutes to, uh, the cheese to kind of re-cool uh, just a bit. But it's also fun when you serve it to have the cheese kind of oozing out. The one thing I didn't bring today were plates. 
Oh, um, we have them in the back. We have the little ones. But yeah. um, so anyway, you got all the good stuff inside there, and then I would just serve a little mm -hmm. bit of that uh, peach mm -hmm. salsa on the top, and uh, that is a perfect meal. And the other thing is too is if you have leftovers, which I don't think you will. Um, you can actually put them in the fridge and then go back to them later as a, as a cold sandwich. Yep. It makes a great yep. cold sandwich later. Um, so that's a super, super easy thing to do, highly customizable, and incorporates a lot of, a lot of these power foods. Yep. So. Any okay. questions before we move on to the next thing? Thoughts, ideas, comments? Here, just I just do I think you're perfect. There you go. Yeah, you got you. Uh, all right, let me pick a, I'll just load this on here and we can divide uh, this up. We have up. one question. Yes, sir? I love cheese, but why, why brie? I know brie is, is great tasting, but can you give a 30 second synopsis on good cheese, bad cheese? Sure, sure. sure. I don't think I've ever given a 30 second synopsis on anything. <laughs> um, but I will do my best to keep it condensed. Um, so you heard the expression, fat is where the flavor is, which is why I don't taste like anything. Um, but uh, brie is either a double or a triple cream cheese and so it is it's just a you know there's just that sort of unctuous it's a great melting cheese um but i mean this is just as i mentioned it's highly customizable if you buy the um i shouldn't mention brand names but the great value uh you know shredded cheddar cheese it, you know it has no flavor to it it's going to melt and it's going to be stringy but it has no flavor so just like i said you can't make chicken salad out of chicken poop the better the ingredient the better the quesadilla so this is an expensive um i hate to say it when i'm doing these classes I'm given like a budget, and I want to spend every every dollar of that budget, right? So if I'm deciding, well, I've got like four dollars left, should I buy the cheap cheese or the, oh, the cheese, the brie cheese? So I always try to, within my budget, and whether it's my personal budget or someone else's budget, uh, try to find the best that you possibly can buy. So brie is a is a great way to kind of notch it up a little bit to that fancy level. But honestly, it's become so uh, so. You know, when I was a kid, there wasn't just brie; there was camembert. Camembert was really the only sort of brie you could get. And that's a specific region in France, and it was expensive. A little wheel of Camembert would be 15, 16 bucks. I bought a wheel of, of good French brie for about 12 bucks. So you can now get a good brie uh, for a lot cheaper. Um, but I mean, it's, it's just a great melting cheese. So there's your minute and 30 second answer. I uh, use what you like, but it's, it's a double cream, and it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic one to use. Let me set up for my next one. If anybody's got any other questions for Shana for a second, let me set up here. Yes, the question was, what about frozen vegetables? They're great, they're great. In fact, they are picked and then frozen with their highest nutrients in them. So frozen or fresh are the way to go, and then canned after that. And make sure you wash off the canned vegetables if you use them. But yes, frozen or fresh are great, they're great. Yes? What about olive oils? Olive oils. Regular virgin, extra Good virgin. Good question. Extra virgin olive oil, it's the least processed, that's the one that would be best to use. A lot of times when we're cooking not high heat, you can still use your extra virgin olive oil or you could use canola oil. But we try to stay away from some of your um, cottonseed oils, soybean oils, partially hydrogenated oils. They cause a lot of that inflammation in your body. And yeah. you'll see in Hans's cookbook, um, which they are over there in the spices as well if, if you want to buy or look through them, he uses some really fun oils too, avocado oil, some nut oils. And those finish a lot of dishes. Those are great addition to the extra virgin olive oil. Yeah, think of oils. I mean, again, I have a ridiculous collection of jams, jellies, vinegars, and oils. And my wife's like, seriously, you bought another oil? Uh, but I use them much the way an artist would a paintbrush. I mean, they each have their own nuance. And for a raw something like we did that, a pecan oil or a hazelnut oil would be fantastic. And you can, or pumpkin seed oil, you can take it in a different direction with those flavors. For cooking, I typically like to use avocado oil because it has a really high smoking point. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't burn until it hits about 500 degrees. And again, I wanna go fast and furious and then done. So I wanna go high, high heat and then done. So today, actually, I grabbed my extra virgin olive oil for the, for the purposes of the demo. But 90% of the time, I'm using either grapeseed oil for, for this kind of searing uh, or I'm using uh, avocado oil. You'll pay more per bottle, but you're gonna use a very small amount and it'll last you a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't skimp on your oils. Right. If it doesn't taste good, I and mean, you can go to Whole Foods now or these small markets, IGA might have it too. Um, you can have uh, tasting sessions and somebody, the idea of sticking olive oil in your head kind of sounds a little off-putting. That's because you've not tried good olive oil. Good olive oil tastes like olives. And that's a pretty neat thing. It tastes fantastic. All right, so we'll have more questions in a second, but while this is hot, let me, let me talk about what we're doing. I'm actually doing something which seems sort of sacrilegious. I'm cooking lettuce. And I don't know why, but that just seems weird to think of cooking lettuce, even though 
you know, we cook its cousins all the time, kale and cabbage and those mm -hmm. kind of things, but Finish. seared yeah. romaine uh, is a fantastic leafy green. And then the, uh, the other combination there is cucumber. So we're doing seared romaine and cucumber. Uh, thank you, and I'm looking for, here, I'll lift it up here. Uh, so seared romaine, cucumber, a little bit of onion, and a little ginger. Now, at the beginning, what I'm doing here is the, the technical term, the cooking term is sweating. I am sweating. But uh, this is, <laughs> It was a technical term. No, but the, uh, it's called sweating. I'm sweating the onions and the ginger together, and I want to do that early, and I want to do it on high heat. And this absolutely brings out, the wind's blowing this way, sadly, but it smells amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and it really does kind of open it up a little bit. It, it makes all this stuff <laughs> come alive. Um, so I just want to get this until it's just at the translucent point, where it's just starting to be uh, not, not all the way cooked through, but as soon as it starts to sweat, those flavors come out. I do a good pinch of salt, and again, same deal. The salt is an extract, and it's going to pull out those uh, those uh, kind of essential oils that are in there. And then I'm going to go in with the turmeric. And if you can, I wish we had a, a monitor. Maybe next time we'll we'll bring a video monitor so you guys can see a little better. Um, and see, Hans, that's a great combination. You have your oil going on, so it's the fat, the turmeric, which is that anti-inflammatory yep. spice, and then you have the pepper, the salt and pepper, kind of your mixture. That's a very, yeah, very good combination. It's a great, and you can see it turns crazy yellow, yeah. crazy fast. Yeah. Um, and it's it's pungent. I mean, it's wildly pungent. I wouldn't eat these onions like this. It's going to be too hot and spicy if I were to eat this as a side. But by the time I add it to all of this stuff, uh, that's when things start to happen. So I'm going to go in with my cucumber, which I've uh, peeled, seeded, and chopped. And you can leave the seeds in there, but the seeds are where the gas lives. Mm -hmm. um, and you can buy what they call burpless uh, cucumbers. Uh, which is a great name to buy burpless cucumbers. They could have called it the other direction, cucumber too, I guess. But, uh, and I would sell them to my kids faster if I had the other direction. But anyway, uh, but essentially the seeds are where the gas is. Some people have problems digesting seeds. Seeds are, mm -hmm. uh, they are great for you, but again, if you, if you don't eat them often, sometimes you have a problem uh, digesting those. So, and with our romaine lettuce, and this is a great way if you have extra lettuce that maybe is just starting to go a little limp. I mean, if you had it in the salad drawer maybe a little too long, it doesn't have that crunch that you want uh, anymore for a salad. Well then get things hot, sear it. Now I'm turning the heat off at this point and I just want it to wilt just a little bit and then I'll season the taste. But this makes an amazing, the term is a la minute, which means of the minute. I don't know why we gotta make everything French. This is ridiculous, but um, it is an a la minute. It takes, well, how long did it take me? Three minutes yeah. to do all this. Uh, rough chop the romaine. Mm -hmm. The romaine you don't wanna chop ahead of time. Everywhere that metal touches the lettuce, it's gonna turn a little brown. So if I'm just chopping and going straight in the pan within the next five minutes, fine. But I always keep a, um, a plastic or a glass knife uh, on hand for, for chopping lettuce. You want to have a, a lettuce knife is what they're called uh, because they will, if you're chopping lettuce with a, with a, with a uh, bladed that's metal, it'll absolutely turn it, turn it uh, kind of brown. So I want to generate a little steam here just so that it kind of wilts a little more. So I'm going to use an impromptu dome or if you have a lid, leave that for just a second. And it's own what they call carryover heat. Even though I've got this turned off, just the heat from the pan. The pan doesn't get cold the second you turn it off. So that carryover heat's gonna finish it off and that's uh, that's where we are on that. And what a fun way to use lettuce, right? We, we aren't used to that really. And that's where we were going to put the kale if it was in season, right? If yeah, we exactly. found it. So that would work great. Any of those greens in there, and greens are a powerhouse, particularly the kale. And that's, so that's, and that's why we um, liked it. And I want to mention that because it is the, it is a cousin of kale, right? right. It's in that brassica mm -hmm. family or in the mm -hmm. cruciferous. It's called cruciferous because the the uh, the flowers when you look at them look like a cross. So the cruciferous vegetable. Um, so there are any of the things in that family, the brassica Brussels family. Brussels sprouts, yeah. cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, yeah, yeah cabbage. Yep. And uh, the the thing about those is that they're very high in sulfur, mm -hmm. which is exactly why when your grandma or your mom was cooking kale, that's why the house smelled like a you know bad. I'll say that. <laughs> And because that sulfur is leached out, and then that sulfur smells like a rotten egg. I mean, it's, that is the smell of a rotten egg. You're smelling the sulfur. Uh, but sulfur is one of the best anti-cancer mm -hmm. foods. Mm -hmm. Cancer cannot exist in a sulfuric environment. So the more, that's why when you see the list of the anti-cancer foods, it's always kale and cabbage right. are always on number one and two. You know, mm -hmm. they, they flip-flop. I don't know how those two compete. Like, what do they do, you know? Kale okay, and cabbage. Yeah, exactly. It's whoever gets more publicity. More brownie points, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, so um, anyway, the, uh, the trying to work these things in there, but again, when you overcook it, you're leaching all that stuff out. So you want that little bit of bitterness. I mean, bitter's not a bad thing. Uh, I always tell people, again, that you know, if, if ingredients are like the artist's palate, 
Um, there's some weird colors in the world, right? There's a, there's a color called puce, P-U-C-E. Well, puce even sounds nasty, right? I mean, it just sounds like what you'd think that, you know, I don't know. But puce, if used in the correct way, is, is a really important part of that sunset. Or even brown. I mean, you, you don't look at brown and think, oh, I'll paint with that. But, I mean, there's a place for it. And bitter is the same way. Bitter, if you're just using bitter, is bitter. I mean, you don't, you don't want to use it. You think of the word bitter as a, as a negative term. Sour, you think of it as a negative term. Well, she's sour today. Whatever. But, I mean, sour in the right... Actually, that's what I forgot here, actually. The lemon. We're supposed to go with it. So, um, you know, I'm talking about sour. I remember. Where's my microplane? Oh, right in front of me. I can't find things right in front of me or something. Uh, so I'm using uh, a washed or organic uh, lemon. I don't want wax in this, but I do want to get some lemon zest in here. And I want just the zest, not the pith. So down to the white and then stop. You don't want to go beyond that. So a little lemon zest in here goes a long way. And then I'm going to use a little of the lemon juice as well. And the best way for that is to put your weight on it, which is hopefully a little more substantial than mine. <laughs> so uh, I lost about 90 pounds during my ordeal. And people that didn't know my illness, they would say, oh my God, you've lost so much weight. What's your secret? <laughs> and uh, it still happens to this day. And I say, well, it was highly effective, but I wouldn't recommend it. The most expensive hobby I've ever had. So, um, but anyway, uh, I'm using a fork, uh, a spork, whichever. And uh, so I, I put my weight on the lemon. I'm just using this to kind of wrench out some of the juice. And then I can take the side of the fork and use some of those little bright bursts of, of citrus in there as well. So back to what I was talking about, though, this on its own, it's going to be like, oh, too yeah. sour. Mm -hmm. uh, ginger on its own, whoa, too spicy. You know, kale on its own might be too bitter, especially if it's overcooked. But if you use those things, you know, correctly, in moderation, just a little of that, you're trying to get, you're trying to create this picture. You know, sunset isn't all reds and blues. It's all those little things in between. So um, I'm an analogy guy. I use analogies for everything. And to me, I think that, that usually is the best analogy. Think of it as... All this are colors on your palate, and color is one of the most important things you can add to yep. your diet. Yep. Lots um, of colors. Lots of you know, I, I try my best not to mention names of places because I don't want people to, to think that they're bad places. They're not, but there is a place that uh, sells barrels of crackers, and um, <laughs> so when you go to this place that sells barrels of crackers, do they, have, do they sell crackers? Or crackers? I don't know. I don't know. That's pretty don't, funny though. So. Um, <laughs> Imagine your food, right? So I just delivered your food. There's not even a sprig of parsley on the plate. It's this shade of brown with that shade of brown with a lighter shade of brown with a darker shade of brown with a side of brown and a side of brown. Like what? I ordered a veggie plate. What color, 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 the, right? The brown color. plate. What is this? That is not a veggie plate. That is a fry plate. That is a fry overcooked to death plate. That's a cemetery. That's a funeral procession in my mind. This is death of a vegetable, as presented by a place that sells barrels of crackers. Um, I'm going to get in so much trouble. Just something. I'm sorry. So, um, but anyway, so the color, 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 color. As much yep. color as you possibly can get in. Three quarters of the yeah. plate. So this possible. is done, and again, last last second little, uh, it needs nothing else. It might need a little season of, of salt and pepper as you like it, but this hot, last minute on a plate, side of whatever it is, with that little deck of card sized piece of pork mm -hmm. or fish or meat or whatever it is um, that you want to do, or skip it all together, use this in there, mm -hmm. um, use it with that. It makes a great little side. And, uh, that didn't make enough for everybody to try, but a few people can try this at the end. But that's our seared romaine cucumber. And I just wanted to give you sort of a last minute addition to give you an idea of what to do with some household everyday ingredients, maybe when they're just a tiny bit past their prime for a salad. Now we have some samples. If you have a sticker under your chair, you'll get to sample some of Chef Hans's wonderful um, makings up here. I don't have a chair. I know, me neither. I'm getting hungry up here. Okay, so if you have a pink sample, I mean a pink, you're going to go to the pink table, and if you have a blue, you're going to go to the blue table, and we are all done. Thank you very, very much.